Welcome to theCUBE's continuing coverage of AMD's fourth generation Epic launch. I'm Dave Nicholson and I'm here in our Palo Alto studios talking to Greg Gibby, Senior Product Manager, Data Center Products from AMD, and Mohan Rockham, Technical Marketing Engineer at Dell. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello, hello. Thank you. Thanks. Glad to be here. Good, good, good to see each of you. Um, just really quickly, I want to start out, uh, let us know a little bit about yourselves. Mohan, let's start with you. Uh, uh, what, do you what do you do at Dell exactly? So I'm a technical marketing engineer at Dell. I've been with Dell for around 15 years now. And my goal is to really look at the Dell powered servers and see you know, how do we, how do customers uh, take advantage of some of the features we have, especially with the AMD Epic processors that are, have just come out. Greg, and uh, what do you do at AMD? Yeah, so I manage our software defined infrastructure solutions team and really is a cradle to grave where we work with the ISVs in the market, so VMware, Nutanix, uh, Microsoft, et cetera, um, to integrate the features that we're putting into our processors and make sure they're ready to go and enabled. Uh, and then we work with our valued partners like Dell um, on putting those uh, into actual solutions that customers can buy. And then we work uh, with them to sell those uh, solutions into the market. Before we get into the details on uh, the uh, fourth generation Epic launch and, and what that means and why people should care, uh, Mohan, maybe you can tell us a little about the relationship between Dell and AMD, how that works. And then, and then Greg, if you've got commentary on that uh, afterwards, yeah. that'd be great. Yeah, Mohan. Absolutely. Uh I mean, we, Dell and AMD have a long standing partnership, right? Especially now with the Epic series, we have had products with since Epic first generation, we have been doing solutions. We have uh, across our, the whole range of Dell, uh, the Dell ecosystem, we have integrated AMD quite thoroughly and effectively. And we really love how performant these systems are. Um, so yeah. Greg, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I would say the other thing too is, is to, that we need to point out is, is that we both have really strong relationships across the entire ecosystem. So, you know, memory vendors, um, the, the software providers, et cetera. And we have technical relationships, we're working with them to optimize solutions so that ultimately when the customer buys that, they get a great user experience right out of the box. So Mohan, I know that you and your team do a lot of uh, performance validation testing uh, mm -hmm. as, as time goes by, I suspect that you had uh, early releases of the fourth gen Epic processor technology. Um, what, have you, what have you been seeing so far? What, what can you tell us? I mean, AMD has definitely knocked it out of the park. Uh, time and again, uh, in the past four generations, I mean, in the past five years alone, we have done some database work where in five years, we have seen 5x the performance. Uh, and across the board, AMD is the leader in benchmarks. We have done virtualization, where we will consolidate it from five into one system. We have world records in AI, we have world records in databases, we have world records in virtualization. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's the AMD Epic series has been absolutely performant. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you with one number here. We, when we went from top of stack Milan to top of stack Genoa, we saw a performance bump of 120%. And that number just blew my mind. <laughs> so that, that prompts a question for Greg. Um, often we in, in you know, industry insiders think in terms of performance gains over the last generation or the current generation. Uh, a lot of customers in the real world, however, are N minus uh, two. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're a ways back. So I guess two, two points on that. First of all, the kinds of increases the average person is going to see when they move to this architecture correct me if I'm wrong, but it's even more significant than a lot of the headline numbers because they're moving two generations, number one. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. But then the other thing is, a no. question, is, is the question to you, Greg. I like very long, complicated questions, as you can tell. The question is, is it okay for people to skip generations or you know, make, make the case for upgrades? I guess is, is yeah. the, is well, the well, yeah, so a couple of thoughts on that. First too, you, you know, Mohan talked about that 5X over the generation improvements that we've seen. The other key point with that too is, is that we've made significant process improvements along the way, moving to seven nanometer, now five nanometer. And that's really reducing the total amount of power or yeah, the performance per watt that the customers can realize as well. So, and, and when we kind of look at, you know, 
why would a customer want to upgrade, right? And, and I, I want to rephrase that as to why aren't you, right? There, there, and there is a real cost of not upgrading. And so when you look at infrastructure, the, the average age of a server in the data center is over five years old, right? And if you look at the most popular um, processors that were sold in that time frame, it's, you know, eight, 10, 12 cores, right? So now you've got a bunch of servers that you need in order to deliver the applications and meet your SLAs to your end users. And all those servers pull power. They require maintenance. So they, they, they have the opportunity to go down, et cetera. Uh, you have got to pay licensing and service and support costs and all those. And, and when you kind of look at all the costs that roll up, even though the hardware is paid for just to keep the lights on and, and not even talking about the soft costs of unplanned downtime and, um, and uh, you know, uh, not meeting your SLAs, et cetera. Um, it's very expensive to keep those servers running. Uh, now, if you refresh, right, and you now you have processors that have 32, 64, 96 cores, now you can consolidate that infrastructure and reduce your total power bill. You can reduce your CapEx, you reduce your ongoing OpEx, you improve your performance and you improve your security profile. So it, it really is more cost effective to refresh than not to refresh. So Mohan, what has your experience been, you know, kind of double clicking on this uh, topic of consolidation? Um, I know that we're going to talk about virtualization and some of the, the results mm -hmm. that you've seen. Uh, what have you seen in that regard? Uh, does this favor better consolidation in virtualized environments? And are you both assuring us that the uh, ROI and TCO pencil out on these new big bad machines? I mean, Greg definitely hit the nail on the head, right? We, we are seeing tremendous savings, really, if, you, if you're consolidating from two generations old. Uh, we went from, as I said, five is to one. You're going from five full servers, probably paid off, down to one single server. That itself is, you know, in terms of, if you look at licensing costs, which again, with uh, things like VMware does get pretty expensive, you do have, if you move to a single system, yes, you are at 32, 64, 96 cores, but if you compare to the licensing costs of, you know, 10 cores, two sockets, that's still pretty significant, right? Uh, that's one huge thing. Another thing which actually really drives the thing is we are looking at security. And in today's environment, security becomes a major driving factor for upgrades. Uh, Dell has its own set of uh, cyber resilient architecture as we call it. But, and that really is integrated from processor all the way up into the uh, OS. And those are some of the features which customers really can take advantage of and help protect their ecosystems. So what kinds of virtual, virtualized environments did you test? We have done, I mean, virtualization across, uh, primarily of course with VMware, but the Azure stack, we have looked at Nutanix, we have, you know, PowerFlex is another one within Dell. Uh, we have vSAN ready nodes. All of these, I mean, the OpenShift, we have a broad variety of solutions from Dell and AMD really fits into almost every one of them very well. So uh, where does uh, hyperconverged infrastructure fit into this, into this puzzle? Uh, we can think of a server as, uh, as something that contains not only AMD's latest architecture, but also latest PCIe bus technology and all of the, you know, uh, faster memory, faster storage cards, faster NICs, all of that, all of that comes together. Uh, but how mm -hmm. does that play out in Dell's hyperconverged infrastructure or HCI strategy? I mean, Dell is a leader in hyperconverged infrastructure. We, I mean, we have the very popular VX Rail line. We have the PowerFlex, which is now going into the AWS ecosystem as well. Nutanix uh, and, of course, Azure Stack. With all these, uh, when you look at AMD, we have up to 96 cores coming in, right? We have PCI Gen 5, which means you can now connect uh, dual port 100 and 200 gig NICs and get line rate on those. Uh, so you can connect to a, uh, your ecosystem. Uh, and I don't know if you've seen the news, 200 and 400 gig uh, uh, routers are, and switches are selling out. That's not slowing down. The network infrastructure is booming. Uh, if you want to look at the uh, AI ML side of things, the VDI side of things, uh, the accelerator cards are becoming more and more powerful, more and more popular. And of course they need that uh, higher end you know, data path with that PCI Gen 5 brings to the table. 
GDR5 is another huge improvement in terms of performance uh, and latencies. So when we take all this together, you talk about hyperconverged. Uh, you know, all of them add into making sure that a with hyperconverged you get ease of management. But B, just because you have ease of management doesn't mean you need to compromise on anything. And the AMD servers effectively is our no compromise offering that we at Dell are able to offer to our customers. So Greg, I've got a question a little, a little bit from left field for you. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we covered uh, Supercompute uh, Conference 2022. We were in Dallas a couple of weeks ago. And there was a lot of discussion of the, you know, the current uh, processor, bat processor uh, manufacturer battles and uh, a lot of buzz around uh, fourth gen Epic uh, being launched and what's coming over the next year. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what this architecture can deliver for us in terms of uh, things like AI? You know, we talk about virtualization, um, but if you look out over the next year, do you see this kind of architecture driving significant change in the world? Yeah. Yeah, 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 it has the real potential to do that, right? From from just the building blocks, right? So where we we have our chiplet architecture, we call it, right? So you have an IO die, and then you have your your core complexes that go around that, and we integrate it all with our Infinity Fabric. Um, you know that architecture allows you, if if we wanted to, to you know replace some of those CCDs with uh, specific accelerators. And so when we look two, three, four years down the road, um, that architecture and that capability already built into uh, what we're delivering um, and can easily be moved in. Uh, you know, we just need to make sure that when you look at uh, doing that, that the the power that, that's required to do that, you know, and um, and the uh, the software, et cetera, and those accelerators actually deliver better performance as, as a dedicated engine versus just using standard CPUs. The, the other things I would say too, right, is, um, if you look at emerging workloads, right? So data center modernization um, is a, one of the buzzwords you heard, cloud native, right? Um, and in these container environments, well, A and B's architecture is really just screams, uh, you know, support for those type of environments, right? Where when you get into these larger core counts and the consolidation that, uh, uh, that Mohan talked about, now when I'm in a container environment, um, that blast radius. So a lot of customers have concerns around, hey, you know, having a single point of con uh, single point of failure and having more than, you know, X number of cores concerns me. If I'm in containers, that becomes less of a concern, right? And so when you look at cloud native, containerized applications, data center modernization, AMD is extremely well positioned to take advantage of those use, use cases as well. Yeah, Mohan, and when we talk about virtualization, I think, we, you know, sometimes we have to remind everyone that, yeah, we're talking about not only virtualization that has a full-blown operating system in the bucket, but also mm -hmm. virtualization uh, where the containers have microservices and things like that. Uh, uh, I think I, th I think you had something to you had something to add, Mohan. I, I did, and I think going back to the accelerator side of business, right? When we're looking at uh, the current technology and looking at accelerators, we, I mean, AMD has done a fantastic job of adding in features like AVX 512. We have the Bfloat 16 and Int 8 features. And some of what these do is they have they're effectively built-in accelerators for certain workloads, especially in the AI and media spaces. And in, in some of these use cases we look at, for example, are inference. Uh, traditionally, we have used uh, external accelerator cards but for some of the uh, you know entry level and mid level use cases cpu is going to work just fine especially with the newer cpus that we are seeing this fantastic performance from the accelerators just help get us to the point where you know if i'm at the edge if i'm in certain use cases i don't need to have an accelerator in there i can run most of my inference workloads right on the cpu yeah yeah you know you know the game it's an endless chase to find the bottleneck <laughs> And once we've once we've solved the puzzle, we've created a bottleneck somewhere else. Uh, you know, back back to the supercompute uh, conversations we had specifically about some of the uh, uh, AMD Epic processor technology and the way that Dell is packaging it up and 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 leveraging things like connectivity. That was one of the things that was also highlighted. This idea that increasingly connectivity is critically important, not just for supercomputing, but for high performance computing that is, that's finding its way out of the realms of simple, you know, of, of uh, Los Alamos and, uh, and down, to, uh, down to the enterprise level. Uh, 
Gentlemen, any more thoughts about the partnership or, uh, or, or maybe a hint at what's coming in the future? I know that the, uh, that the uh, original AMD uh, announcement was announcing and previewing some things that are rolling out over the next several months. What, so let me just uh, toss it to Greg. What are we going to see in 2023 in terms, of, in terms of rollouts that you can share with us? Uh, that I can share with you. Yeah, so uh, I think look forward to see more um, advancements um, in uh, the technology at, at the core level. Um, uh, I think we've uh, already announced, uh, you know, our, our product code name Bergamo, where we'll have up to 128 cores per socket, right? Um, and then uh, as we look in, how do we continually uh, address the, 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 this demand for data, this demand for, I need actionable insights immediately, right? Um, look for us to continue to drive performance leadership um, in, our, in our products that are coming out and, and address specific workloads and accelerators where appropriate um, and where we see a, a growing market. Mohan, final thoughts. Uh, on the Dell side, of course, we have four very rich configurable and rich and configurable options for with AMD Apex servers. Uh, but beyond that, we, we will see a lot more solutions. Uh, some of what Greg has been talking about around the next generation of processors or the uh, t uh, the next update to processors, you'll start seeing some of those. And we, you'll definitely see more use cases from us and how you, customers can implement them and take advantage of the features that, I mean, it's just, it's just exciting stuff. Exciting stuff indeed. Gentlemen, we have a great year ahead of us uh, as we uh, approach possibly the holiday seasons. I wish both of you well. Thank you for joining us. From here in the Palo Alto studios, again, Dave Nicholson here. Stay tuned for our continuing coverage of AMD's fourth generation Epic launch. Thanks for joining us.